All right, so what we're doing today, I have uh, Nancy Zone, who, who is with me today, and I think most of you know Nancy anyway. I'm referring to her as Nancy Zone today, but in the future, in the very near future, I won't be referring to her as that. I'll be referring to her as Pastor Nancy. Nancy is in school right now. She will finish it up in another two or three months. She'll be heading to San Antonio, Texas, where she will be ordained a, a minister, a pastor, and she'll be doing that in the middle of July. And um, so, yeah, give her a hand. She's in school. She's working. And, I mean, she already has some other titles, and those of you who know her know that she's very well-versed. That's why I have her up here today. So she's minister select right now. Nancy Zone is here with me. We've been in a series called Frequently Asked Questions. So for the last two months, I've been answering questions about um, what does the Bible have to say about, here they are, suicide, homosexuality, tattoos, profanity. What does the Bible say about heaven and hell, pets in heaven, drinking alcohol, smoking pot, sex, marriage, all of those things. I've been talking about those for the last couple of months. And the last two or three weeks, we've given you the opportunity to ask me, and I've drug her into it as well, questions to answer. And so we have six questions here that over the last couple of weeks, people uh, have submitted the questions they, they want to have answered. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to take those questions on and talk about them. Um, and see if we can answer the questions. And then, depending on how it goes, we maybe, maybe will open it up to you today. Maybe. We'll see. I'll, I'll talk about that later. So the first question that I have here is about mental illness. And uh, the question came about as how do we explain mental illness and disabled people and all that, and what is God's purpose in that? So I'm going to turn that over to Minister Select Nancy Zone first to answer that question. Okay, yeah. The person asked, he understands, the person said, I understand physical suffering, but why do people have to suffer mentally? So um, first of all, mental illness is in the brain. The brain is part of our physical body. So that, that's part of our body. So you, you can't separate mental illness from parts of the body that are ill. <clears throat> so there are many causes of mental illness. And sometimes it's an injury to the brain. Sometimes it's an accident. Sometimes it's a concussion. And those things cause brain injury, and then there's mental illness. Mental illness can also have a spiritual root. And so it's not that the person said, I can believe for physical healing, but why mental illness? So do you see that they're connected, that all healing is from God, mm -hmm. that um, tragedy suffers, losses, and, and trials are all from God. It's part of the fall. Uh, this is the condition of mankind. So there's going to be all kinds of illnesses and problems in people's lives. What we have to do is we have to trust God. Don't worry about how long it takes. If you will persist in faith, believing, if you will build up your faith with scriptures, memorize scriptures and trust God no matter how long it takes, God will hear your prayer and he'll do the best for you. The scripture I had there was, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So trust God. Yeah, let me add a couple of things to that. Um, and she, she did touch on it. Because when Adam and Eve fell, sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, everything went, started to go south since then. So part, mental illness is part of a fallen world because of Adam and Eve. Romans 8 and 20 says this, For creation was subjected to futility, not willing because of him who subjected it in hope. That it, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption 
and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And what that is telling us is that the earth moans and groans. The fires I was praying about earlier, flooding and other places and stuff. All of those are the result of sin. And so as a result of sin, then we get things like mental illness and all of that. But here's where we sort of um, get lost in it is purpose and blame are not the same thing. She just read that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to what? His purpose. So purpose and blame are two different things. I also like to say this about this before we move on to the next one, is because people ask that question about mental illness. And I think it goes to a bigger question as well, as um, is a choice. See, you all have the choice to choose God. You hear it presented to you week after week. You, some of you have had it presented to you since you were a child. And because, let's just say, you have all your mental faculties, you can decide for yourself whether you believe that Jesus is Christ is the Lord. Well, some people with mental disabilities don't have that. That's why I don't want to take the time right now to, to give it to you. But heaven, I believe that people who have mental incapacities and can't decide for themselves because they're not mentally capable of deciding Christ or not, you will see them in heaven. Because everything that I read in the Bible, God always gives us a choice. Is that true? Say amen. Everybody has a choice. The angels, the devil, they had a choice and they chose not to. So I know in heaven, you still have a choice, right? And so some babies they, who die young, they didn't ever have a choice. There's a list of people, things that happen here on earth where you never really get the choice. And I think mental incapacities sort of fit, disabilities fits in that category. So they will make it to heaven, and in my doctrine and teaching, I would tell you it would be during the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then, but that gets into some deeper stuff. So you have to come to Bible study, and I will address it and give you the scriptures and stuff. So that's it on uh, the mental illness and the disabilities is strictly a result of sin. Did I say something to spawn something in you you want to? All right. Number two. Yes. I'm the one that asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived with rheumatoid arthritis for 27 years, and I've seen God do amazing, great things through my physical illness. But I also have a lot of families who have even adult children or such as that are impacted by mental illness, where someone may have bipolar or schizophrenia or something like that, where every day that person is surrendering to God, trying to ask for help and to be healed and it's not happening, and they're spiraling downward, sometimes resulting even in suicide. Now, for me, I've never been healed, and I'm okay with that. God's got other things. I would be one of the ones that walked off and probably got busy instead of coming back and crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But for to see other families impacted, and for me to be able to give a response to someone whose family is going through it, of their sin in the world, and God's got other plan, it's kind of a real canned response. So I guess I was kind of looking for something a little more in depth. Um, and not that you have to answer this here, but if there's something later, I guess physical illness, I because I've lived with it for so many years, I can see the purpose and explain it. And the ministry became out of that. But I still have a struggle with understanding um, for the person that actually lives with a mental illness, every day they get up and they would rather be on the other side mm -hmm. of <laughs> heaven or hell. Anything is better than this place. And those families that are Okay. Yeah, I would say I would say some of that, but I'm going to give you another deeper answer to what you said, and then I'll move on, and then you guys can come and talk to me, or you know, we can talk, have a session, or whatever. Is the first thing I would say to that is, you don't know how God has already been moving, because there you sit, and obviously the devil's been trying to kill you and been trying to kill all those people 
that you're talking about and that you're referring to, and it hasn't happened yet. So you're still under somebody, under God's grace right now. And what he has already been doing for you, you're not going to really be able to figure it out till you get to heaven. And he goes, yeah, I carried you through this, 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 and this when you were losing hope. Now, the other part of it I would say about that is she lightly mentioned it, right? Because mental illness, a lot of it does have to do with sin. And now that really starts to uh, really get into a very, very touchy, touchy subject that I'm not willing to sit up here and talk about. But there is such a thing as generational sin, and there is certain soul ties and stuff that we get that our great-grandfather or whoever, whatever, whatever had that has spilled over or can spill over into mental illness. So that is a complete process that would have to be vetted out by individual to individual to individual. So like I said, that's pretty deep. And I know she didn't want to really say that because it sounds like, you know, when you say generational curses and that kind of stuff, man, that's just a heavy duty thing to say. I mean, anytime, anywhere, that's a heavy duty thing to say. And this definitely isn't the form for that. All right. Second question uh, was about loving a prostitute. I will let you explain that and Hosea. Here, here's the way it was written. Someone loves that prostitute, and I believe someone will make an honest woman of her. What about Hosea? Because ultimately God loves. I was saying, I'm not sure there's a question in there. Uh, is this yours, Maggie? Because it oh, man, you just got put on blast sense. in front of everybody. Oh, my goodness. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, okay. Ooh, so much for that. I'm gonna, uh, we're two for two. We've given two, and people are fessing up. This is confessional. Come up here and confess. No. I'm going to, okay. Like I say, I'm not sure where the, what the question is in here. But anyway. Okay, regarding Hosea, the, the prophet Hosea, and probably not many of you have read that book because it's a little Old Testament book. You may or may not have read it. Here's the story on prostitution. In the book of Hosea, God calls him and says, I want you to go and uh, get yourself a wife of harlotry and have children with her. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So Hosea obeyed God. He went and bought this woman. He bought her at the slave market. He took her home and he told her not to play the harlot ever again. But she did. She left him and she went and took for herself a lover. Then in Hosea 3.1, if that's up there, God said to him, go again. Love a woman who is loved by her lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. The whole point of this book is that God was acting out through, Isaiah, uh, through Hosea, sorry, uh, he was acting out what Israel did to him. So the act of the physical adultery and prostitution of Hosea's wife is the same way God felt about them turning to pagan gods and other gods. It hurt him just as much as it hurt Hosea. So it was a, it was a story that God wanted to teach Israel. And when they looked at the prophet Hosea and his wife and how she betrayed him over and over again, then God was saying, this is how you, Israel, have treated me. You've committed spiritual adultery. So God is not condoning prostitution in this book. He is illustrating Israel's rejection of him. Okay, now as far as, that was the story of Hosea that was in the question. But as far as prostitutes today, I would say there's always hope with God just like for the mentally ill with your question. There's always hope, don't give up on God. James says, don't be double-minded. You know, today I'm gonna believe God for it and tomorrow I'm, I don't, I'm doubting him. No, you must stay with God. You, you put your petition before God and then you leave it there and you keep, you keep 
telling him how much you trust him, that you believe you'll get your answer, that he's a good God. Just build yourself up in faith. And prostitutes today, um, you know, they always say prostitutes have a soft heart. Well, um, who knows what, how they got that way. Many of them were sexually abused when they were children. Many of them were kicked out of their houses. They're, they're drug addicts, dope addicts, alcoholics. And so this is the only way they have to make it on the street. But God has a way out for them too, Amen. just like every other sin. That's right. He can deliver them. So I hope that answers your question. Is yeah, you? I want to add something to that as well. That, um, that also is not a license for men to go out and start hanging out with hookers trying to, con <laughs> trying to convert them. So let me be clear about that. That's not what, everybody is not Hosea. Right? That was an isolated situation. So you all listening online as well, this is not open season on let me go hang out <laughs> with some hookers. Yes. The question was, who would marry a prostitute? That's what the question was. You were up there saying your thing and talking about this and now, okay, well, who would marry a prostitute? And you went on to something else. And I thought, well, Jose did. But you're right. Well, so it was you. Okay. <laughs> I just, I took a wild guess. True confessional, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we have going on okay. here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's get on to the next one, which is, um, will we still have our memories uh, from life on earth when we get to heaven? Will we still have our memories? So... Um, I think I'll go ahead and take that one on first. All right, so memories from heaven. The first thing that I think we have to understand is this, is what's important to us here is not going to be important to us there. That's, we have to get that, and we have to get that in our head. So you'll get a little smattering, a little taste of what heaven is like. You're getting it now. Praising, worshiping. The whole shift of everything that we're thinking about is on Jesus Christ and then is on God and not on what we were doing here. So there's a complete shift in what's going on there. I have to give you my own personal opinion and then I'll give you some scripture. My personal opinion, did you all hear me say my personal opinion? Yeah. Say yes if you heard me say yeah. My personal opinion is this, that it cannot be heaven if I don't know anybody there. This is just not heaven, right? There are certain promises that God has made us here on earth that I believe will get you to heaven. And I believe that those people who have done those things, confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus died and rose from the dead, you will be saved. I believe that heaven has to include that. And when we get to heaven, we will recognize our loved ones. But God being who God is, you would think that we would, with that same paradigm I'm giving you, we would miss people who didn't make it to heaven. But that's a shift because God being who God is, I can't miss somebody I've never met in India. I don't know them and I can't miss them. I believe that's the way heaven is, is you will know the ones who are there, who you knew here, but the ones that you we're here, and you knew them who didn't make it to heaven. It'll be as just like the example that I just gave you. You can't miss with who you never knew. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, here's my scripture on that. How do I know? Well, I'm only giving you a couple because there's a lot. There's a lot in the Bible that says that. And pretty much what it is, it has to do with recognizing, right? So Lazarus was in, you know, being tormented in the, the right, and he looked across and saw you know, the rich man, he knew he was, there was some memory or something that was going on. He knew he was rich. He knew he was poor, something, right? Also, the scripture that I use was Matthew 17, 3 and 4. It's where Peter and, you know, the boys are up on the mountain of transfiguration and all that. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him, talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, how does Peter know that that's Moses and Elijah? They've been dead for they a few thousand years. They had name tags on. 
he, he knew them. There wasn't Photoshop. There wasn't pictures that were snapped. There was no depictions. How did he know that that was Moses and Elijah there with Jesus? So he knew them. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he's there and Mary Mag Mary's right there, right? And Mary's there and she's distraught and crying and whatever. And Jesus is talking to her and then he calls her by name. And somebody better catch this. He called her by name. And when he called her by name, she turned and looked and went, Lord, it's you. So whatever his body was at that particular point, when he called her name like he's going to call yours and he's going to call mine, we'll know who he is and we'll know who people are. Okay. I have a little bit here. Um, having a memory of our past life will be important so that we can appreciate the grace that God has extended to us in forgiving us. And if you went to heaven and you didn't know anything about your former life, you would look at Jesus, you would see the scars in his hands and feet and wonder, well, what's that all about? Mm -hmm. We have to know. We're going to know what happened here on earth. And it, we're going to the judgment seat of Christ, the Christians are. So uh, our life is going to be reviewed. We're going to give an account of everything we did, of everything we said. Uh, that's in the scripture. So we are going to know what we did but we are also going to see the grace and mercy of God. There won't be condemnation for us, but how could we appreciate what Jesus did for us if we didn't know the sin that he saved us from? I have one scripture uh, from Revelation 21.4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So if, if God is wiping tears from our eyes, we're probably remembering the things we're sorry for that we did in our life on earth, or we're remembering losses or trials. And, and so uh, when God wipes it away, we'll forget all that. So obviously I think, like Pastor does, that the, we will definitely have memories of what our life was on earth. But it, we won't feel bad, we won't be condemned we won't feel condemned or guilty. Oh, that was good. I didn't even read what she was going to say today because I wanted to be surprised. And that, that I like that. That was good. Excellent. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it's two to one or one to two. All right, here's question number four. Um, is committing suicide a sin? Now, um, I already addressed that. I did a complete message about that, which was um, FAQ number one. So if you go online and you look it up, you will hear a complete message from me about suicide being a sin. So I'm going to let her talk about that. And whoever wrote that question or you have questions about it, you have to go online and go ahead and, and just watch the videos and see what the complete message was. So, Okay, go ahead. I've got suicide is a tragedy, and yes, it's a sin. I'm going to read the scripture first, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if, the, if a saved person, a person saved, but they're in circumstances that they feel are hopeless, I don't know what that kind of hopelessness feels like, but it must be horrible to feel desperation and hopelessness that your situation just will not change. And when you open the door for depression, it goes deeper and deeper. Satan gets a stronghold and he, he clouds the minds of these people. So in their depression, if they can't turn to God and there's no one that knows and helps them and they commit suicide and they're saved, I just read that neither death nor life can separate us. So the saved person will be judged on their desperate situation. I believe that we don't know the mindset of the one committing suicide. We don't know. So we can't say that's the unforgivable sin because we know it's not the unforgivable sin. There's always hope for the depressed person 
if they cry out for help. Life is a gift from God. We don't have the right to take anyone's life, even our own. So um, God cares, don't do it. This is an answer for the saved person. Now for the unsaved person, well, they're already unsaved. So the way they die doesn't really matter. They're, they're already on their way to hell because they're not saved. So I say there's hope and judgment for the saved person. Amen. And even the scripture she read at uh, Romans 8, where you can write this down, those of you, any of this that is helpful to you. Right before that, she gave us 38 and 39, but Romans uh, 8 and 1 says what? There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So when you're in Christ Jesus, you're in Christ Jesus. And then on 39 it comes back, which I love that scripture. It does nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And the desperate act of committing suicide, although it is murder, which obviously is a sin, is not, as she said, an unpardonable sin. She also said that we don't know what someone was saying and what they were thinking, you know, right in their last moments. And that is one of the tragedies of that is the people who are left here on earth are left with a bunch of questions about that. So that's the answer to that. Number five um, had to do with sexual, was of a sexual nature and the language that was on the card. I'm not going to read it as such, but that's what the content of it was about sex and and is it okay to be uh, sexually active is pretty much what it said. And again, I spoke on that. I spoke a complete message on that. That was FAQ number nine. And all of them on the webpage are numbered and they also are saying on there what the subject matter is. So if you want to know what I said about that, then you can go on there online and watch it. Okay, so sexual activity, is it a sin? I believe I said, oh, yes, it is. Affirmative, roger that, right. Negative, don't do it, right. It is a sin, but I'm going to let her go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> okay. That. Um, I wrote, God made your body to be holy, not to be yielded to sexual sin. Romans 1, and I don't even have the verse because it's, it's continued, it's a, it's a long passage. It says, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And sexual immorality is mentioned as one of the specific things that God condemns later on in the same chapter. So uh, God does say it's ungodliness, it's unrighteousness. God created sex to be used, uh, to be performed within marriage and God wants us to be holy. We're not our own. We were bought with a price, mm -hmm. and so we belong to God. Giving your body to that hurts your own soul, hurts people around you. If you have children, it hurts them. If you commit adultery, it hurts your marriage. It brings unhappiness. It brings sickness. It brings low self-esteem, whereas sex used as God intended brings blessings. So if you're doing it, stop. Repent and ask God to forgive you. He will. Amen. <laughs> just keep it simple. <laughs> just, just stop it. No, you know what? This just hit me while she was talking. There are some things of God that are above our pay grade. And sex is one of them. God has already talked about that, and he's already said that the sex is supposed to be saved for the marriage, for the marriage bed. Why in all this, is, that's above our pay grade. Well, really, all the things of God that we're talking about are above our pay grade. We just need to do what we're told to do. Because a lot of the understanding, we don't have the mental capacity, foresight, and are not going to live long enough to really see all the results of some of the things that we do. That's what makes it above our pay grade. So we may be able to justify some behaviors and stuff in the time and in the moment, but the, the ultimate effects of those things that we do that God says not to do, we can't, it's way above our pay grade. You have no idea. 
And that sort of kind of goes to that first question we were talking about with mental illness and stuff as well. That's what I meant when I said generational curses, soul ties, and some of that other stuff. Well, if you think that isn't prevalent in the sexual arena, you should pick up the Bible and you should read it, right? So, yeah, definitely it's a sin. All right? And the last question that we had was interesting, I think, too, because it just asked us the simple question, is laziness a sin? (laughs) Being lazy, is it a sin? Laziness is a subtle sin because to commit it, you don't need to do anything. (laughs) In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So man was told to take care of the garden, not just sit around, you know, with, with a lemonade in one hand and under an umbrella in the sun. So Genesis 1.26, then God said, let man have dominion over fish, birds, cattle, over all the earth. So man was told by God, you're, gonna, you're responsible for taking care of of this garden, for naming the animals, for taking care of them, for tending the garden. Man was meant to work. Man is created in God's image and is created to work as God did and still does in his creation. God is working every day in all our lives, in nations, in leaders' hearts. He's still working in Genesis after the fall. This is after Adam and Eve sinned. In verses 17 and 18, of chapter three, God says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. So they were still told they are going to have to till the earth. They're gonna now have to pull the weeds. Their their planting and harvest might not always be be blessed for them. We're gonna work hard. And because of all the rain, I've got a garden of weeds. And I'm just waiting to get some kind of spray to spray the whole mess, but I'll probably inhale it and pass out. Anyway, um, so people that are lazy are, are takers. They expect others to do things for them. They don't want to do things for themselves. Don't be an enabler of that kind of person. And if you're a lazy person, don't be a taker. Paul told the Thessalonians that if they don't work, then don't let them eat. Proverbs had something to say about this, too. A couple of things. Proverbs 21, 25. The desire of the sluggard. You ever heard anyone called a slug? I mean, you know what a slug is. A snail, right? So that's what uh, Proverbs is calling the lazy person. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. Proverbs 20 and 4, the sluggard does not plow after the autumn. He begs during the harvest and has nothing. So laziness, absolutely 100%, again, is a sin. And I will go even so far as to say this because of what we read here about what was going on in the garden. Because, you know, that is going to return. God's going to book in that. So a lot of people think that, I don't know what people think. They think when we get to heaven, we're just going to be riding around on clouds, playing harps, wings fluttering, and whatever image you have in your head. Wrong. No, you have some work you're going to be doing in heaven. But you know what? Because of what we just said before about the work in heaven, you know, mostly it's work if you don't like to do it. Right? I mean, if you are really in your wheelhouse and you're really doing what God has created you to do, you like to do it. So you have to imagine, yeah, I ain't know who maybe you're going to say amen about working on anything, right? So when you're in heaven, you have to remember everything is perfect and you will be perfect and you are and will be perfectly created there And whatever it is God created you to do, you will do that perfectly. Does that make sense? And that does not mean, don't you know that there are some people who like to farm, who like to go out and dig in the dirt? I don't. But there are people who like to do that. There are people who like to do just about everything. So when, if that's what God created you to do, 
then why wouldn't you be doing that in your perfect self when you get to heaven? And it's going to be a place where everything is operating perfectly and people are operating perfectly. And right now, you can't imagine that. I can't imagine it either. Because we all say amen if you have to do things you don't want to do. I think that was a chorus of everybody in here. You ain't said amen all day, but when I said that, we have everybody in here said amen, right? We all on this planet have to do things that we don't want to do. But when we get to heaven, that's all gone. Some of the things we want to do here makes us cry, make us sad, make us on and on. She just read it. He's going to wipe all the tears away. You will function 100% the way God meant you to function, and so will everybody else. Amen? Amen? All right, so it's, let me see what time it is. So does anyone have any question that's pressing on your heart right now? Yes, sir. How do you explain the age of the earth? The Bible says what? I love that question. Everybody here, let me say it for those who are online. He asked me, how do we explain uh, the age of the earth? Because science and the Bible, Christianity, is so far off. I do have an answer for that, but I'm going to let her go first. I don't you, have an answer for it. You know? <laughs> you just, see that, did you see that ball get bounced right back into my court? <laughs> now that's funny all right <laughs> all right so here's how i'm going to answer that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth whatever 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 and then he rested okay so let me fast forward and God created Adam. So, can anyone here tell me when God created Adam, how long on this earth was it just God and Adam? And don't even try to answer because the answer is say, I don't know. That's right. You don't know. Why? Because every day is as a thousand years to God and every thousand years is the same as one day. So when he created Adam, we don't know how long they was walking around the earth together. We have no idea. A year, a 10 years, a 1,000 years, 10,000 to be, who knows. Then after he did that, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. And he created Eve. So now here's Adam and Eve and, and God. How long were those three together? Everybody say, I don't know. That's right, you don't know. I don't know either. A year, 10, 1,000. So all of those things to me then makes arguing about how old the earth and the universe, in, in my head, it makes it void. It's just, I can't argue it. I can't argue with the science of it, even though I know the science of it is going to change as the technology changes. It's going to change, and they're going to change their mind. And then if the earth is still around in a 1,000 years, they're going to call the scientists quacks that live right now. They don't know what they're... So, right, we know the situations change things Volcanoes can change scientific numbers and change them and mess them up. We know that the earth was flooded and, right, for it was flooded. That messes things up. So to me, it's just not an arguable point. There's too much, too many variables that are there that if they want to say the earth is 10 billion years ago, <laughs> go for it. I'm not going to argue with that. Because maybe it is and maybe it isn't. So, did I answer that? Perfectly. Well, thank you. Did I get one of those? Yes. So, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's an asterisk, <laughs> it's an asterisk <laughs> answer. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, it's been fun just hanging out and talking with you. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, you guys can come on back up. Um, and we're going to be out of here in a minute. What you see happening right here, I'm going to tell you what this is. This is Wednesday night Bible study. 
That's what it is. You guys are face forward right now, which means you're looking at the back of someone's head. But what we've been doing here is a bit interactive. I've been interacting with her a little bit, interacting with you. That's Wednesday night Bible study. We're sitting in a circle. I'm not standing up there lecturing everybody. We take situations. We take doctrine. We take, I must have said the wrong thing. Where are you going? No, nah, you're going to get to pray us out. <laughs> Not yet, though, because I'm still in the middle of my soliloquy. <laughs> All right. So this is my commercial for Wednesday night Bible study. Here, we don't have time for me to ha interact like I did with you today. But when we're on Wednesday night Bible study, all of this stuff comes up. It comes up, and we sit, and we talk about it, and we talk about those things. So if you really want some of your other things answered and more in depth, you're going to have to take another step. And I know they do that also in, win in Monday night women's thing. You just have to take the next step. Amen? Amen? All right. Will you stand with us? So go ahead and uh, pray for us and pray us out, and then we'll hear a song, and then we'll be out of here. Okay. Our Father God, thank you so much for the brothers and sisters coming this morning to hear us. And, and we, we hope that we've given them some, some solid answers that they can grab onto. And Lord, anytime they have other questions, they can just put them on the connection card, put them in the offering, and Pastor will address them. We'll address them because we want our people to, to have knowledge. We want our people to understand the word of God. And so we care about what you care about. Thank you, God, for our people this morning. May they go out and may they have a wonderful week, blessed by you, protected by the angels of God, and led by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this morning's service and everything, Lord, that was done in Jesus' name. Amen.